We need to be responding positively uh, as Christians for the good things in our tradition that's already there and to preserve and protect them and celebrate them uh, irrespective of what the secular culture does. Halloween is not, in fact, pagan, as many Protestant-influenced Christians have erroneously come to believe. In fact, Halloween is a Catholic tradition that emphasizes the saints, the souls in purgatory, and our own mortality. Scripture tells us, The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell, these realities ought to be at the forefront of the Christian mind. In this week's Miked Up, we'll be explaining the Catholic roots of Halloween, which is, in the end, really all about preparation for death. Halloween literally means All Hallows' Eve, referring to the vigil of All Saints' Day, when we honor those in heaven. That's where Halloween comes from. Later in the show, to discuss all of this, we'll have with us author Joseph Pierce. But for now, here's our Miked Up report. Witches and vampires, skeletons, jack-o'-lanterns, and tombstones, these are all symbols of Halloween in the modern world. But what does Halloween mean, and where does it come from? The word Halloween is made up of a combination of two words in the English language. The first word, hallow, means holy, and the second part is a shortened version of the word evening. So Halloween means holy evening. And more specifically, hallows means holy ones, or saints. And so Halloween really means Hallow's Eve, referring to the Eve of all saints. Every year, Halloween falls on the last day of October, which is the day before November 1st, the Feast of All Saints. The church commemorates on this day all the saints. This feast is so important for Catholics that the church makes it a holy day of obligation, meaning the faithful are bound to participate in the mass. On holy days of obligation, the faithful are also bound to abstain from those labors and business concerns which impede the worship to be rendered to God. Right after All Saints Day is All Souls Day. The church reminds us to pray for the dead, which is an ancient practice of the church and reminds us of the existence of purgatory. That's a dogma of the church. It's real. People go there. The Apocalypse says in chapter 21, it says nothing unclean shall enter heaven. And the word there is uh, kanon, which is used, kanos, which is the Levitical word for unclean. God is an all-consuming fire, and fire has multiple properties. Fire can burn, fire can cleanse, fire can give warmth, fire can give light. In heaven, the analogy here is fire is warmth and light, of course, but in purgatory it's cleansing, and it hurts because you're burning off dross. And this isn't something you're doing to a building, it's being done to your soul. So whatever little dross is there, whatever little tiny remains of sin, either temporal punishment due to sin or some imperfection in your charity, that has to be burned off of you. It's an incredible mercy of God, but it hurts. It's, and that's, that's the suffering of purgatory. Praying for the dead is an ancient Christian practice. In fact, it goes all the way back to the Jews in the Old Testament. In the second book of Maccabees, Judas Maccabee, a Jewish priest and military leader, gathered with his army the bodies of some of their members who died in battle. Under the tunic of every one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids the Jews to wear. Realizing the sinful state in which their comrades died, they turned to prayer, beseeching that the sin which had been committed might be wholly blotted out. Christianity has always encouraged the faithful to pray for the dead, even making such prayers part of her liturgy from ancient times. Praying for the dead goes hand in hand with the reality of purgatory. The church teaches that, as for certain lesser faults, we must believe that, before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. And this dogma of purgatory was reaffirmed at the Council of Trent. Therefore, this holy council commands the bishops to strive diligently that the sound doctrine of purgatory, handed down by the Holy Fathers and the sacred councils, be believed by the faithful and that it be adhered to, taught, and preached everywhere. Because Protestants like Martin Luther denied the dogma of purgatory, the Council of Trent clarified that this is in fact the ancient teaching of the church and this is de fide of the faith. The modern world has turned this time of the year into an obsession with death and witches and all this other stuff, but it's really a healthy reminder of death, which is a reminder of the four last things, right? Death, judgment, heaven or hell. 
Of course, we know nothing unclean can enter heaven, so sometimes the passageway to heaven in the next life is through purgatory. So it's also a reminder for us here to remember the souls in purgatory and pray for them constantly. It's part of the church's liturgy. It should really be part of our daily practice. All of us offer our fasting, offer our penances, offer our almsgiving and good works, all you know, for the souls in purgatory. I've heard people say like, why would you pray for the souls in purgatory when there's still people here on earth? At least they know they're saved. Okay, this is not an either or. You pray for both. Pray for all of us here on earth, of course, and pray for the souls in purgatory because the church is one, it's united. There's the church triumphant, the church suffering, and the church militant. And we're all in this together, and we have to pray for all the members of Christ's mystical body, no matter what level they are in the journey to heaven. Up next is our church militant interview with Joseph Pierce. Pierce is a native of England, and he's an internationally acclaimed Catholic author and speaker. He's written seven bestsellers, including Tolkien, Man and Myth, C.S. Lewis and the Catholic Church, and Wisdom and Innocence, A Life of G.K. Chesterton. Those are just a few. Pierce has also taught at well-known Catholic universities such as Aquinas College, Thomas More College, and Ave Maria University. On top of that, he's the director of book publishing at the Augustan Institute and senior contributor at the Imaginative Conservative. Exactly one year ago today, he wrote a piece for the Imaginative Conservative on Halloween. Right after this, we'll be analyzing Halloween from a Catholic lens with Joseph Pierce. Joseph, thank you so much for being with us today. It's good to see you. My pleasure. So, as you know, we're rolling around to the time of Halloween. And in the modern era, there's really been a, a serious backlash to Halloween, not just among Protestants, among kind of those of a more puritanical bent, but strangely, there's been a backlash even within traditionalist Catholic circles to Halloween. And we wanted to do an episode and really cover the topic because that seems unnecessary. If you really understand the history of Halloween, um, it's a Catholic holiday. And people are trying to now work in a bunch of new traditions that aren't necessarily part of the Catholic tradition uh, into Halloween. And it's a needless fix to a problem that doesn't exist. So... Could you tell us a little bit maybe about the Catholic roots of Halloween? Um, the key thing is that, you know, we, we know that the secular culture will abuse anything that's good. So, you know, All Hallows Eve is, is an ancient Christian uh, festival. It's the eve of All Hallows, uh, All Saints Day. And that's followed on the following day, November the 2nd, the All Souls Day. And it's all connected with uh, remembering the dead, the, the dead in glory, um, that, as in the saints, uh, all hallows, uh, all saints, but also uh, the, the souls in purgatory, uh, the All Souls Day. Um, so we are m meant to remember the dead. And of course, in the modern world and the secular culture, with, with its morbid, you know, fascination with, 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 with decay, um, you know, obviously gets it wrong, but they also get Christmas wrong and they get, you know, uh, they, 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 they added all sorts of things onto on, onto Christmas that have nothing whatsoever to do with the nativity of Christ. So, um, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be knee-jerk reactionaries that allow the secular culture to call our tune. In other words, that, you know, we only, we, we only respond negatively to what the secular culture is doing. We need to be responding positively uh, as Christians for the good things in our tradition that's already there and to preserve and protect them and celebrate them uh, irrespective of what the secular culture does. Yeah, that's right, because as you said, the secular culture is going to abuse everything. So say because there are a bunch of immodest costumes or even, you know, realistic looking demonic costumes, that doesn't mean Catholics have to uh, let the 
let the holiday take on that form. You don't have to let that distortion take root um, in, in our traditions. And so what is the original nexus between Halloween, All Souls Day, All Saints Day, and um, a kind of a remembrance of one's mortality or the concept of mortality to begin with? Like, why is there a connection there? Well, well, obviously, one of the things that the church always points us to is the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. The memento mori, the reminder of death, is a large part of what we need to be keeping in mind as Christians. In other words, that we need to be keeping our mind the finishing line. All of us are going to die. All of us are going to die. The end of the world, for us is the moment that we die, and that could be tomorrow. So we, sh we sh should be spending the whole of our lives with, with our own uh, mortality in mind. So the church always teaches about the necessity of keeping the, the memento mori, the reminder of death, at the forefront of our minds, knowing that death also points to three other last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. So we, this is something which we, we, this should be part of our lives year round. Uh, but obviously, you know, the church in her wisdom has set aside a day where we celebrate the saints in glory, the, the saints in the church triumphant. And then the following day, all souls, we, set, we celebrate and pray for uh, the souls that are in purgatory. But isn't the timing, you know, pagan? Doesn't this come, isn't it an importation and an accretion of pagan ideology onto the Catholic Church. That's the objection you hear from a lot of Protestants and maybe Protestant converts who have taken their, their ideology a little bit accidentally into the Catholic Church. Basically, you know, the Catholic Church in her history has always worked to evangelize uh, and, and to evangelize the pagan culture. So what it what it's done with, with, with pagan festivals such as um, uh, Yuletide, for instance, the pagan uh, winter festival, midwinter festival, it baptizes it, uh, it turns it into a feast celebrating the, the nativity of Christ, um, and it exorcises those aspects of paganism that are contrary to the spirit of Christ, and then what you have, you have a baptized festival you don't uh, you, you you go with the culture but you purify it um and that's that's authentic enculturation that the catholic church has practiced uh since 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 the early church now i want to say something about an understanding of tradition by the way uh, with respect to those that want to uproot uh you know centuries old traditions that that J.R.R. Tolkien said about the mania in the 1960s to get back to the so-called purity of the early church he said, I don't understand why a sapling is considered superior to the full-grown tree. And he said that even if the sapling is superior to the full-grown tree, if you cut down the tree looking for the sapling, you don't find the sapling, you kill the tree. So in other words, that we don't, we, we don't uproot the church's traditions merely as a, as a knee-jerk reaction to the way that, that that tradition has been abused by the secular culture. Sure. No, that's right. Um, turning back to a concept you kind of raised earlier, um, it, well, it's natural, it seems like, to remember in certain seasons certain feasts. So, for example, Christmas happening in the dead of winter, it would seem very natural because we're getting the life of the world being given to us, you know, through Christ, through the Incarnation, uh, when we're all in a time of essentially spiritual death. So it's very symbolic and fitting. And it's same with to reflect on our own mortality in basically the, the beginning of fall when we are turning from summer and life into the season of death and dying, which is, you know, fall and winter. Is there something to that or am I reading too much into it? Oh, I think there's absolutely something in that. That's why the, 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 the Catholic churches were set. Uh, were built with the altar uh, facing the east. That's why the, the, the Catholic Mass should be said ad orientum, uh, towards the east, because the east points towards the rising sun, and the sun here is a, is a pun. In English it works as a pun anyway, S-U-N-S-O-N. -S um, and we are meant to be looking to the east or waiting for the coming of Christ. That's what the ad orientum means. So Christmas uh, is a time where now the days are beginning to get longer. 
So you're right in the middle of the dark. This is, you might say, the darkest time of the year, but the, the light is, is, is returned. The light has arrived in Jesus Christ in the midst of the darkness, and now the days will get longer. And again, it, it's, spring, of course, is the, is the age of resurrection, right? That's when everything comes back to life again. You know, the, 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 the buds of the trees, that, so it fits with the resurrection of Christ. And you're completely correct as regards autumn, the fall. This is when the leaves are falling from the trees, where we see death and decay, and, and you know, the, the leaves sort of disappearing into the ground, becoming part of the earth, uh, but then nourishing the earth for the following spring. It's appropriate that we should be thinking of, uh, of, our, of our dead. Um, and I say our dead because, you know, the, the, the Catholics believe in the communion of saints, which means that the, the, the part of the church which we, in time, which we are part of, is the church militant, the church at war. But the largest part of the church is not the church militant, it's the church, uh, the, the church uh, um, triumphant in heaven with all the angels and saints. Um, both canonized saints and those that are there that have not been officially recognized by the church, uh, and also the church suffering. So, you know, and, and these are souls that are passed on from time, from the temporal existence in the church militant to the eternal existence. And we are meant to be in communion with those people in prayer and in celebration. Right. No, that, it definitely makes sense. Um, I, turning back to this pagan festival, Samhain, uh, that, that Halloween kind of supposedly has its roots in. And again, I take that with a grain of salt because so many people who are, who are saying, oh, Halloween is a pagan festival, they, they don't need to say it's pure pagan, but they say, you know, it's a Catholic grafting on to a pagan festival. But the history there is not even very clear. There's, it's, it's more of a tenuous link. And actually, it was monks who recorded the pagan festival of Samhain uh, upon which Halloween is ostensibly built. But there's not a, cr a, a great historical link necessarily. So it's still a little bit subject to debate. But even if it is based on that, again, uh, people think that that's an open and shut case. Oh, you know, Christianity kind of glommed on to this pagan festival um, that celebrates this time of death, and therefore it needs to be excised. But that just isn't, it's not that simple. You can take what's good in other cultures, right? This is what the Second, Second Vatican Council specifically taught. You know, there are elements of truth in other cultures. Obviously, the Catholic Church enjoys the fullness of truth. But, I mean, am I bending over backwards to excuse the Catholic Church? You mentioned enculturation. Am I, uh, you know, just on one on this? Emphatically, you're not. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct. Let, let's take the most basic re example. Um, the, the Catholic Church's insistence on the indissoluble marriage of faith and reason is a, is, is a consequence of the fact that St. Augustine of Hippo baptized the philosophy of Plato, a pagan philosopher. Uh, and uh, um, St. Thomas Aquinas baptized the philosophy of Aristotle, a pagan philosopher. And Christian philosophy is rooted in reason. And, you know, we, if, if we if we're going to say that because uh, Plato and Aristotle were, were, were before Christ, which, by the way, is not their fault, uh, <laughs> that's an accident of birth when you, when you happen to be born, uh, but they were clearly using the God-given faculty of reason to arrive closer to the Logos, who is reason himself. And, and they were so good at it that rather than sort of just abandoning all that and, and, and saying it's all wrong because it's, it's from Plato and Aristotle from before the time of Christ, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, the two greatest doctors of the church, uh, took their ideas and baptized them. So what the church has done with, with uh, philosophy, with reason, it also does with the celebration of the, of the liturgical year. Uh, and uh, we do need to remember the dead. And the fact that the pagans remember the dead it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be remembering the dead. Right. No, that's right. Um, of course. So it, can you give us a little background on how Halloween kind of came to be in its current iteration, in its current form? Because we see it a little bit, obviously, as an amalgamation of All, all Saints Day. It means All Hallows Eve, of course. Uh, so the Eve of All Saints Day. But that's also followed by All Souls Day. Um, and I think there's certain, you know, nuggets of the tradition that are, are based on a blend of these two holidays. 
yeah. and of course that that that's exactly the two go hand in hand now as i said the, the, all, all hallows all saints is the church triumphant all souls is the church suffering and of course the church suffering all, all everybody in the church suffering is in a one-way street to heaven so we are celebrating the salvation of souls when we when we celebrate all saints and all souls day uh, we're in communion with them we're, we're praying for the, the suffering souls but we're also asking for the prayers of, of the saints so this is this is a time of absolutely glorious um uh this the church the church at worship and practice and what she preaches in, in in the most beautiful way and and I, I again i don't understand why anybody should have problems with that now of course we can we, we know that as we, as we said already we know that secular culture you know with its glorification of horror films and and the macabre and the morbid um uh are, are completely not the um making a mockery of, of, of the the um the, the christian catholic understanding of of life after death um it's the culture of death spin uh on the culture of life but the culture of life does not uh have to abandon all that's good true and beautiful in its own tradition merely because um we find that the modern world has taken good things and done bad things with them well you know that is a good jumping off point for something else. And I've noticed a, a steep incline of kind of ninnyism or fuddy-duddyism in Catholicism as a lot of the best Catholics have, have come from Protestant traditions. A lot of the exemplars of Catholicism are actually converts nowadays. And that, that's really good, but it's also a double-edged sword because I feel like, you know, there's certain things you get as a cradle Catholic. You just are immersed in Catholic culture that you don't get necessarily as kind of an adult, maybe Protestant convert. Um, and so we're seeing a backlash to maybe like ghosts or kids dressing up as goblins or in, in a lighthearted way or as skeletons. And it's like, well, why don't we dress them as little angels with halos? And it's like, well, but that's unnecessary. And again, you're, you're hijacking the tradition. Do we have a duty as Catholics to avoid all things that have to do with like the dead on a day like Halloween? You know, I mean, that uh, the great saints, saints such as St. John Fisher, he used to keep a skull uh, in his uh, room uh, as a memento mori, as a reminder of death. Uh, if you look at great Catholic Christian art uh, from the Middle Ages, you will see the depiction of skull, cross skull and crossbone skeletons as a means of reminding us of our mortality, of uh, the fact that we will die. Um, this is actually this is actually something we need to be doing. Um, it's what we what we don't want to be doing, of course, is just uh, celebrating. Uh, the undead instead of the life after death right which is the eternal life so um but catholics are not going to fall into that trap but if, if we're not careful we will we will say well we can't even look at skeletons you know we're going to you know put the skeletons back in the in in the closet um and, and and not not look at them which is absolutely emphatically not what the catholic church teaches you let me give you a, let me give you a practical example actually from the tradition James the Sixth of Scotland, who became James the First of England, wrote a book called Demonology, where he basically said that all manifestations of ghosts were actually demons uh, and could not possibly be the, the, the souls of the deceased. Shakespeare took the Catholic position, uh, which he also sort of uh, took from St. Robert Southall, the, the Jesuit martyr, English martyr, that the, 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 the ghosts, we don't know what ghosts are, but certainly they can be. They can be souls from purgatory so in, in hamlet and in defiance of king james king james's position which is a protestant position you know that all manifestations of the ghost is demonic uh has the ghost of hamlet's father being a soul from purgatory who who exposes um uh, a murder his, his own murder in fact um and then we have the scene uh, the, 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 the memento mori scene, the, the alas poor Yorick, I knew him Horatio scene in the graveyard where Hamlet's holding the skull of Yorick. And that, and that becomes a, 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 one of the most beautiful expositions on the four last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell, anywhere in literature. And, and, and we're looking at the skull while we're meditating upon the fact that we will look like this 
one of these days. And what comes after that? Well, judgment comes after that. And what's the consequence of judgment? There's only two possibilities, heaven or hell. These are things we need to be keeping in mind. And, and, and we don't want to sort of hide the skull and, and, and pretend that, that that's you know, somehow morbid. I mean, it's necessary. Sure. No, that's right. You know, I was actually reading, and it, it turns out that part of the reason people would dress up as skeletons or other kind of, you know, scary-looking um, Halloween themes is to, to channel what happened to seven martyrs in the Book of Maccabees, where they, they kind of went to their deaths in macabre ways. And so that's part of the tradition is actually recalling something scriptural and kind of these heroic, uh, glorious, but, you know, very gory deaths. So there's Christian tradition baked into these things. And it's like, there's, there's an old expression, an old axiom that, you know, the, the conservative, you can get rid of certain traditions, but you have to know why they exist before you get rid of them. Whereas the liberal will rush in and get rid of something before he knows why it exists. It's like if you're going to advocate for getting rid of something, you better be well versed on it as opposed to hearing like the Baptist kind of puritanical rhetoric that goes against the, the, the Halloween because it's steeped in anti-Catholicism. The anti-Halloween is anti-Catholicism and it's particular because it's followed by All Souls Day where we went and, and prayed for the souls of um, the departed. And that's obviously something that is anathema to Protestants in their heresy. Is it, is, I mean, is that right? And, and that's the history as I understand it. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? Maybe talk about trick-or-treating for us. I know there's a nexus there between um, praying for the dead and trick-or-treating. Well, the thing I would say, first of all, is that the cancel culture didn't begin with the woke generation. Obviously, you look, you look through history, and it's been, it's, been, it's been around for centuries. And it, it didn't begin with the communists, and it didn't begin with the French Revolution. For instance, in England... The Puritans uh, cancelled Christmas. Um, so, you know, if, if, if one, once you, you believe that you, your generation, is the first generation to understand the truth, so you treat tradition, you treat uh, the whole collected uh, human experience, which, which history and tradition is, if you reject all that because we've got it right and, and you know, everybody in the past got it wrong, then you end up cancelling things out of pure arrogance and ignorance. And that's basically when, you know, when, when the Puritans um, uh, uh, cancelled Christmas, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Christ Mass, I mean, if you're going to be a radical Protestant, then you know, you're, you're, you're going to want to cancel the tradition because it's steeped in Catholicism. That's, that, that's where it's from. But what the, the figure of Father, Father Christmas, you know, in, in England, you know, Santa Claus is something that's American. But um, the, the English, uh, we've now watched so many um, uh, American films in, in, in England that we, we also say Santa Claus. But, but Father Christmas, actually, the character of Father Christmas has his roots in medieval mystery plays about the nativity. He was a personified abstraction representing the feast of Christmas itself. And he made a comeback uh, during that time when Christmas was banned. Uh, Father Christmas became an image, a symbol of good, merry, Catholic England. So, you know, the, the, the figure like Father Christmas, right, um, is, is steeped also in Catholic tradition. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's... Uh, so what should Catholics keep in mind going forward about celebrating Halloween? What, what do you think is most important... Uh, for them to do, maybe not do, uh, as we, we come up to, to this controversial holiday? Well, I, 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 I personally, I, I'm very happy with, you know, our, our church, for instance, does have all the children dressed up as their favorite saint on, on, the, uh, on the Sunday closest to, to all saints. Um, to all hallows, and I, I'm completely comfortable with that. We can celebrate the saints by dressing up as saints, then or dressing our children up as saints. Uh, that's fine, but we don't want to allow that to eclipse the other 
aspect of it, which is epitomized in All Hallows Eve, you know, where, 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 you know this whole thing about the fact that the, the dead are around All Hallows Eve is a reminder of death, memento mori, and of all souls, which comes after all saints. So we do need to have uh, the Grim Reaper in mind, but right? we do need to have the skeleton and the skull in mind as a means of reminding us of our ultimate destiny, which is the judgment of God. Uh, and therefore, we need to be keeping our own death in mind and also praying for the dead and also asking the, for the glorified dead to pray for us. That's what it is to be a Catholic. Right, right. And, and bear in mind also I would, with, with trick-or-treating, um, that came from people going door to door to, to ask for donations in, in exchange for praying for their, the souls of their loved ones. So this is very Catholic. It's very Catholic to go out trick-or-treating. That's where it came from. Uh, and, and people tend to forget that. Now, one final thing that I'd like to ask, and that's, you know, there's been kind of a cult around the sacramental of exorcism. And so a lot of Catholics have on their mind, like kind of on the front of their mind, um, the, the rite of exorcism and possession. And a lot of times you hear things like, well, if, I, if my kid dresses as a ghost or a skeleton, I'm worried he's going to fall into occultism and get possessed. That's really out there. There's a lot of even kind of bigger name exorcists out there that are kind of going down that path. And I was wondering maybe if you could address that, if, if dressing up as a ghost one night of the year, is that a pathway into possession? Obviously not. And, and one thing I would say as well, if we talk about the morbid imaginations, um, that, that the obsession with exorcism uh, is also a consequence of a morbid imagination. The exorcism basically should be something which is private. Exorcists should be carrying out their business without without being without sort of everybody else wanting to be a fly on the wall while it's happening. That's the same sort of curiositas. And curiositas, by the way, is a sin. Um, it, 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 it's, it's the poisoning of scientia, the poisoning of knowledge. The curiosity um, kills more than the cat. It can kill the soul. Um, and, and so we, we, don't, we should not want to be the fly on the wall uh, learning about exorcisms all the time. That's the same sort of spirit of, of, of those in the secular culture that are obsessed with watching horror movies. Right? It's, 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 a, it's an obsession with the undead which is unhealthy. So, uh, you know, if, if, if we are allowing our obsession with exorcism to exorcise the spirit of, of, of all, all Hallows' Eve and all souls' Eve, we're doing the work of the devil. Right. Well said. Well said. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for being on with us. I, I hope we can uh, have further discussions in the future. Um, you're very, very eloquent, very bright. So uh, we really appreciate you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. God bless. God bless you, too. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Quit the conservative commentary. All it does is get you angry. Red Top Report tells you not only the issues, but also how to fix them. So stop listening to other people rant and join Red Top Report in actually fighting back. Please, no more of simply listening in the echo chamber. It's time to start fighting. And there you have it. Halloween has Catholic roots. The Apostle James reminds us of the importance of saintly prayers when he writes, The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. Pray your rosary every day, live in a state of grace, evangelize, and fight. That's it for this week's Miked Up. God bless you.